At 7.30 on the morning of September the 19th, 1985, Mexico City suffered an earthquake. In less than two minutes, tens of thousands of people would die in the devastation. It was a horrific tragedy for the world's largest city. Mexico had recently been chosen as host nation to stage the finals of the 13th FIFA World Cup. That honor now stood in jeopardy. It is a tribute to the people of Mexico that they recovered sufficiently in eight months and were able to stage the World Cup with enthusiasm and dignity. Out of the tragedy, a sense of national unity and purpose was created. Mexico's sporting pride had been restored. Whatever they might achieve in competition would now be considered a bonus. On June 3rd, in the Azteca Stadium, in front of a 100,000 crowd, Hugo Sanchez returns to play in Mexico City. Sanchez, a local boy, left Mexico City five years ago to make his reputation overseas. He now returns as a genuine star, earning a million dollar salary as the top goal scorer in the Spanish league. Mexico has built her World Cup team around Sanchez. Being their only overseas player, they have trained for two years largely without him. Now, having returned, the expectation is high. The whole nation awaits their hero. In Mexico's opening match against Belgium, the first time Sanchez has played in his hometown for half a decade, the nation watches, willing a goal. When Mexico score through Fernando Cuirate, it is as though God has answered the prayers of a nation, still mending from the tragedy of the earthquake. In the excitement of Mexico's first goal, Sanchez makes an unforgivable blunder, kicking the ball into the crowd. He gets a yellow card and later will miss a complete game when he gets a second. Mexico's second goal brought Hugo Sanchez his only moment of triumph in the World Cup. The hero had arrived and Mexico started to believe in themselves as a footballing nation. 
Although they will win further games and even reach the quarter-finals, this, their first victory over Belgium, allows months of depression to spill over into the streets in a national torrent of relief and joy. Known as the Prince, Enzo Francescoli is a former South American Player of the Year and the inspiration of the South American champions Uruguay. Only days before Uruguay's first match, Francescoli signs a multi-million dollar contract, one of the largest in soccer history, to play for Racing Club of Paris. As with Diego Maradona in the 1982 World Cup, much is expected of Francescoli in Mexico. He is hot, a marked man, and consequently is put under constant pressure against Denmark in the preliminary rounds, a nightmare unfolds for the Prince. Denmark has never before qualified for the World Cup Finals, but the Danes of 1986 arrived in Mexico with an awesome reputation. Their first real test would be against the South American champions. Uruguay are both hard and experienced. Denmark's edge comes from a two-man attack of flair and pace. Mikael Laudrop from the glamorous Juventus club in the Italian league, a player of blinding pace and magical ball skills. Preban Elkiar Larsen, also a star striker in the Italian league, is Laudrup's foil. Elkiar's grit and turn of speed make him lethal near goal. Elkiar and Laudrup are the most feared attack in Mexico. taken to new heights of expertise by the Uruguayans. This knee nudge from number five Bossio to Laudrup's upper thigh gets a yellow card. When Bossio strikes again, another cruel foul minutes later, he gets an instant red card. The Mexican referee shows no compromise and throws Bossio off the field. Uruguay are down to 10 men. A slaughter is now on the cards. Dosen, 
Denmark are two up and looking unstoppable. <laughs> The only relief for Uruguay in the whole game is when Francesco Lee is awarded a penalty at the end of the first half. If at half time 2 1 down, it looks bad for the South American champions, in the second half, it is to get worse. Far worse. Nothing illustrates better the dazzling skills of Mikhail Laudrop than Denmark's third goal. Denmark's future must rest very much on this young man's shoulders. By now, the Denmark short passing machine is running with precision. The Uruguayans hardly get a look in. Francesco knows the game is up, but more agony is still to come. Goal number five, another Laudrup Elkia classic. Sixth Denmark goal, Elkier helping out Jesper Olsen. <laughs> Uruguay suffer their worst defeat in 50 years of World Cup participation, while newcomers Denmark have set Mexico alight and created a wave of Danish popularity. For 15 years, Denmark waited to play West Germany, their close neighbours and the 1974 World Cup champions and 82 finalists. In Mexico, Denmark beat them 2-0. In this, their first ever World Cup, 
they were now one of only two nations from the 24 finalists to have won all their preliminary matches, making them among the favourites to win the World Cup outright. But sport is fickle at the top. A rude shock awaits the Danes. When Emilio Butragueño scores his fourth goal in Spain's 5-1 victory over Denmark, it is a genuine upset. The day the dazzling Danes finally run out of steam. But personal triumph such as Butragueño achieved with his four-goal blitz against Denmark is quickly put into perspective when in the frustration and agony of defeat, Spain is eliminated in the very next round against Belgium. Football is the world's most popular professional sport, the game of the people. To win the World Cup is the pinnacle, the ultimate accolade. Occasionally, one player rises above the rest. In Mexico, that player would be Diego Maradona, captain of Argentina. In his first game against the Korean Republic, Maradona's World Cup started, much like his previous World Cup in Spain four years earlier finished, aggressively. in aggression. Whereas in Spain, Maradona was allowed to be kicked out of the World Cup, in Mexico, the referee gave some protection. As a result, foul on Maradona, Argentina's first goal was made. Once that goal had been scored, it seemed to release Maradona from the memory of Spain, and he immediately grew in stature. It's obvious that barring injury, Maradona would be a hard man to contain in Mexico.
Maradona's second match is against world champions Italy. It will be the only time in the whole competition that Argentina have to come from behind. It is becoming clear to beat Argentina, you have first to beat Maradona. Argentina have not beaten Uruguay in a World Cup game for 56 years. It would take Maradona's magic to even the score. Pedro Pasculi, 1-0 to Argentina. Into the second half, Maradona sets up a solo run that splits open the Uruguayan defence. Incomprehensibly, the Italian referee disallows the goal. The resurgence of French football in recent years owes much to one man, Michel Platini, a playmaker of extraordinary ability who is both the conductor and soloist in the delicate fluid style that has helped make France the current European champions. So valuable an asset is Platini that for the past three years he's been voted European Player of the Year. has eluded him is the ultimate reward, the World Cup. Platini's first real test is against current world champions Italy. 
France has only beaten Italy once in the past 60 years, and that was in a friendly. The winner of this game will claim a place in the quarterfinals. The delicate touch of the French immediately makes its mark. Just 14 minutes into the game, Platini coolly chips a Rochateau centre into the open net. Once France score, Italy never looked like coming back. into the second half, rushed home. Tigana set up the final thrust. Stop it, drives it home. France have knocked out the world champions and will celebrate their first major victory over Italy in over half a century. To become world champions requires consistency over seven matches against all nations. Sometimes the least experienced opponent can cause the most frustration. When France meet Canada early in the competition, Platini and his European champions were expected to dazzle with a barrage of goals. But for 78 minutes, they got nothing but resistance from the semi-professional Canadians. Papin's winning goal, 12 minutes from the end, brought relief for Platini and the hustled French. Canada's moment had passed. But France would continue.
past three decades, Brazil has offered a style of football that has both entertained and thrilled. Skillful, attacking, dangerous. When they come up against France in the quarterfinals, a confrontation of epic proportions is on the cards. Brazil are the first to score through Correca in the 17th minute. Opening 30 minutes, Brazil are on top, but the in-depth quality of the French means that no opponent can become complacent. Girares, allez Gigi, voilà qui donne maintenant à destination de qui Eh bien, qui donne pour Manuel Amoros, Amoros, Girares, Girares, Dominique Rocheteau. Allez Dominique, il faut centrer Dominique. Oh, voilà, peut-être oui, Dominique, 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 Platini a égalisé, je dis qu'il fallait y croire, et nous avons eu raison d'y croire. Un centre de Dominique Rocco, Platini était là, et il a égalisé pour l'équipe de France. Bravo donc à l'équipe de France, même si l'équipe du Brésil a fait une superbe première mi-temps. Eh bien, l'égalisation de Michel Platini est tout à fait logique. Et d'ailleurs, c'est le premier but des, le premier but des, des Brésiliens depuis le début du championnat du monde. Score 1-1, the second half sees France increase the pressure. Then again, the flow turns and Brazil thrust forward. minutes from the end, under pressure from the crowd, aging Brazilian hero Zico is brought on to help give penetration up front. He sets up an immediate attack. It leads to Branco being fouled. Franco searches for the pain in his leg while sneaking a look at the referee. The performance was worth the wait. Brazil are awarded a penalty. Zico is given the job. Zico's failure and that dramatic save forced the game into 30 minutes of extra time.
In the dying minutes of extra time, Latini sends a beautiful through pass to Belloni, who's clear. But he's manhandled, a yard outside the box by Carlos. And the Romanian referee turns a blind eye. France lose the chance of a likely goal. And after 120 minutes of play in wilting heat, their frustration and disbelief shows. The result of this quarter-final will now be decided by penalties. Socrates blows out on the first Brazilian strike. Stopira scores for France. Zico gets it right. Score, 2-2. Two, two. Belloni scores. The manner of the goal is disputed, but the referee lets it rest. 3-2 to France. Branco for Brazil, 3-3. Michel Platini walks forward to take the penultimate penalty for France. It is his 31st birthday. Michel Platini lives a moment of private hell on his birthday, seen by a billion people live around the world. At this moment, even he couldn't imagine this day ending victoriously. Julio Cesar for Brazil. Agora 
Joel Batts cannot believe his luck. Score still 3-3. Final responsibility rests on the shoulders of Louis Fernandez, so long a mainstay for France. The most important single kick of his life. France win 4-3 on penalties and for their second successive World Cup secure a place in the semi-finals. Karl-Heinz Rummenigge and Michel Platini are two of the most successful players ever to lead West Germany and France. They met in the semi-finals in the 1982 World Cup in Spain. They meet again in the semi-finals in Mexico, speaking their common language, Italian. They know the territory well. Both realize this will be their last chance at ultimate World Cup glory. Early in the first half, Rummenigge is brought down, just outside the French box. falls to a straightforward free kick from Andreas Bremer. Germany go ahead, 1-0. For the remaining 80 minutes of the game, France forced the pace, but never get that elusive equaliser. Even a Platini gem is disallowed. West Germany go through to the final. They're fourth in the last six championships. And for Franz Beckenbauer, German national team manager and captain of the 1974 World Cup champions, a unique double achievement is but one match away. France, yet again, go out in the semi-finals, and at 31, Michel Platini must now consider his World Cup dream has slipped away.
Although England's World Cup starts disastrously, by the time they meet Paraguay in the second round, after an emphatic win over Poland, they're looking strong. Paraguay. Gary Lineker's goal is the catalyst for England's domination and confirms conclusively that Lineker, voted England's player of the year, has an uncanny ability to score goals. Dangerously, the ball on the right foot there, but you tried to shot, and the ball tucked away. England, they are now two goals up, and it's Peter Beardsley who's done it. The corner, far side of the field. The ball cut right through the heart of the Paraguayan defence. The ball broke luckily for Beardsley. England, they're now looking towards the quarterfinals at Argentina. Stevens of Tottenham, the two Spurs men together, the ball stroked in by Stevens, Lineker there, he had about three hours, he needed two seconds, and it's Argentina now in the quarter-finals, surely, that was a beautiful build-up, Gary Lineker makes it England three, Paraguay nil, and Gary Lineker now becomes the top scorer in Mexico in 86. With six goals from their last two matches, England are confident against Argentina, but Maradona still has to be stopped. In the first half, England hold their own. Then, five minutes into the second half, the turning point comes with a decisive Maradona break. Maradona on the ball, always danger, lays it outside and finds Valdana. He can't turn. Maradona's there, rises above Schuch. And is that goal going to be allowed? Schuch came out, Maradona challenged him. Peter Schuch is claiming he was fouled. And that goal is going to be allowed. The ball flicked through by Valdano. He turned it inside and it was a handball, no question about that. That was the only reason that Maradona was able to rise above the incensed Peter Schilk. He got his left hand to the ball, he stretched, he turned it past Schilk. Schilk could not believe it, and the ball, with a little sigh of apology, just bounces into the open English net. Ay, 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 qué lindo que has hecho esto, Diego. Qué 
Before England can recompose, still reeling from the disputed first goal, Maradona strikes again. Inside their own half, Maradona turns like a little eel and comes away from trouble. Little squat man comes inside Butcher, leaves him for dead. Outside Fennec leaves him for dead and puts the ball away. And that is why Maradona is the greatest player in the world. He buried the English defence. He picked up that ball 40 yards out. First he left one man for dead, first he went past Saxon. It's a goal of great quality by a player of the greatest quality. It's England the nil, Argentina two. The first goal should never have been allowed. But Maradona has put the seal on his greatness. He's left it thumbprint on this World Cup. He scored a goal that England just couldn't cope with, they couldn't face up to. It was beyond their ability. It's England nil, Diego Maradona two. In a last desperate bid to get back in the game, England bring on John Barnes. Anywhere near it, played back again by Sansom, out to the far side. Now oh, then, can Fennec get the cross and he can't, but he finds Barnes. Good skill here by Barnes. Can he get the cross and he can? The header, Lineker! And England have scored. Lovely work by Barnes down the left. He beat two men on a sixpence, took it to the goal line. Perfect cross, and the man we mentioned a moment ago was there, Gary Lineker. And he gets his sixth goal of the World Cup. It's almost his first touch of the ball. He did it right. It's now England 1, Argentina 2. But Lineker's last-ditch goal, a goal that will earn the golden boot as top scorer in the World Cup, is too late to stave off defeat. Argentina go through to the semi-finals by the hand and genius of Maradona. Viva Argentina! Viva Argentina! Argentina semi-finalista! Te abraza! Pilardo te abraza con su con este momento, con el Articochea, te abraza el Copa de la Olla. Although Belgium have surprised many by beating both Russia and Spain to reach the semi-finals, against Maradona, no defence has yet proved impregnable. Valdano beats the keeper with the aid of his arm. Referee disallows it. Maradona mounts another attack down the right flank. 
again near miss. In the second half, Maradona steps up a gear. He flicks an Enrique pass into the back of the net, 1-0 to Argentina. Belgium come back and stretch goalkeeper Pampino. Then, in the 63rd minute, picking up the ball outside the 18-yard line, Maradona accelerates through the Belgian defence. Another display of dribbling brilliance. Argentina 2-0 and into the final against West Germany. There are some athletes so gifted, so commanding, that they can lift a team, even an entire sport, to an extraordinary level of accomplishment. Sometimes they carry a whole nation. Diego Maradona is such an athlete. Argentina meet West Germany in the final in front of 115,000 spectators at the Azteca Stadium. The stage is set for an intriguing confrontation. Germany, the masters of defense. Argentina, the improvisers. Two former world champions who know only too well the pressures of the major occasion and the value of the final prize.
West Germany, led by Karl Heinz Rummenigge, thrust forward into an early attack. Maradona instigates a cunning back pass, but gets cruelly cut down from behind. Seconds later, Cusifo also gets tripped. Maradona suffers. From the outset, he has been tightly marked and given little space to breathe. The Brazilian referee awards a free kick. Burashaga curls his shot into the German penalty area. Jose Luis Brown rises to head it in. In the first half, although West Germany hold a tight defence, they are unable to make any effective thrust at the Argentina goal, whilst Maradona is a continual danger. Whenever Maradona breaks free and looms large as an immediate threat, the German defence scythe into action. Maradona becomes a target, ever more vulnerable. By half-time, a pattern looks set. West Germany, who in their three previous World Cup games have relied on penalties and free kicks to take them through, look to have their work cut out restraining Maradona and the uninhibited South Americans. To the professional pundit, one more Argentinian goal would appear to settle it. The battle for control of the midfield continues, with Argentina making the running. In the 55th minute, Valdano surges forward. Maradona spirals round for Hector Enrique to thrust a through ball for Valdano to score.
now looks over for Franz Beckenbauer's dream of becoming the first man ever to captain and manage a World Cup championship team. But never underestimate the Germans. West Germany force a corner. Rudy Voller flicks it across the goal mouth. Rummenigge gets a foot to it. Score 2 1. Maradona knows his defence was careless. A likely winning margin minutes before now looks fragile. Maradona lifts the pace, but the flow doesn't roll his way. drops back to assume a midfield role. He sets up an attack. Dieter Hunes reaches for it, but is fouled off the ball by Enrique and gets a yellow card. The unthinkable happens. Ja, ist das zu fassen, sämtliche deutsche Ersatzspieler Franz Beckenbauer, alle sind sie an den Spielfeld. Rudy Voller in the 84th minute flicks the ball between goalkeeper Pompido's open hands. Score 2 -2. With less than 10 minutes left to play, Maradona can sense his dream slipping away. Surrounded, Maradona finds space to slip a long loping pass through to Burchard.
Maradona, one personal detail remains. The goal in the final to seal his triumph. In the dying moments, he makes one last push. It takes four men to stop him. Maradona's final goal is not to be. On this day, June 29, 1986, Diego Armando Maradona has reached the peak and attained immortality. Can you see the gap between right? 